Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. On today's podcast, we have actress, writer, filmmaker, and activist Kirsten Pfeiffer joining us. She has dedicated her platform to bringing awareness to the injustice of human trafficking and is currently working on a film with us at Exodus Cry. Tune in to learn more about her incredible journey and the important work that she's doing. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad that you're here. This is awesome. Thank you. It's an honor um, to be here. So we met at an event that you were hosting, which was the release of your short film, the premiere of your short film, um, a documentary about trafficking. That's right. And um, we had been introduced shortly before that. And what struck me at the event was how similar your passions were mm. to ours. So the passion for film, creativity, the art, cinema, mm. your passion for faith, like that you're a person who's really fueled by a deep, genuine, sincere faith, and your passion for um, trafficking as a cause, yeah. and, uh, and just to fight trafficking and to raise awareness about trafficking. And I leaned over to the colleague and I was like, she's one of us, you know, I'm like, <laughs> so, um, so I think, you know, from there, like I was really grateful to have the chance to go on your podcast and, and now we're working on a project together. So I yeah. thought it'd be fun to have you on and just to, to talk about this. And I think like what I'm curious to hear you talk about is your passion for fighting trafficking, um, working inside the film industry and like what that's been like for you and you wear a lot of hats in the film industry, different things that you're doing. So maybe we could start there. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm just so honored to be here. Like, it's funny how you said you were had that moment at the, the premiere because I feel like that's kind of been my experience on the other side of just seeing everything that Exodus Cry is doing and feeling like even before I met you guys, just knowing that I wasn't alone in the things that I was feeling called to and just seeing how well you guys were doing it just kind of gave me that light to look up to. And um, it's just really full circle to be sitting here with you and just and working with you guys in these different capacities. So first, just wanted to honor you and you guys and thank you for everything you're doing because so cool. it genuinely does just like pave the path for so many people out there that feel called to this and it's overwhelming to be like, how do I even get started? But seeing that there's places like Exodus Cry to get plugged in has just made mm. all the difference. So That's so cool. Yeah. But like with that, I feel like, so my backstory, I got into the arts and entertainment through acting. I've been doing that since I was younger. And I always knew even in that, that I wanted, and this might sound cliche, but I knew it was more than just acting. I knew I wanted to have some significance and use those creative passions for good. Um, and I didn't know exactly how that looked, um, but you know, my whole life ever since I was young, I felt really called to empowering women specifically. And so it's interesting to see how God has kind of taken me on this journey of highlighting specifically within that human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And um, I moved out to LA 10 years ago um, and like from there, I studied at UCLA and I was pursuing acting, but I also started to really explore the other parts of filmmaking. And so screenwriting, producing short films, and really from a place of just being honestly impatient with waiting for someone to give me an opportunity to act. And more than that, like when I did get an opportunity, it was like sorority girl number two and like these things that are great i'm super grateful to have any opportunity to do what i love but um again like that kind of nudge that there is some deeper purpose much deeper than sorority girl number two i was like i'm just gonna try writing the stories that i want to tell um so i started doing that and around the time that i started producing my first short film right after i had graduated um God really started to speak to me about this issue of human trafficking. And ironically enough, it was through a short film campaign that A21 put on that just that I saw for the first time at a conference. And it just 
struck me and I remember being like, what is that? Like, this is happening. And I looked around and I was like, what do I do? Like, I went and I bought a t-shirt at the conference because I just like needed to do something tangible. Um, and from there, it was just a series of like divine appointments and God really speaking to me that culminated a few months later on a mission trip I was at in Guadalajara. Um, we were volunteering at a girls' orphanage and I didn't speak Spanish. These girls didn't speak English, but I just, there was just this beautiful bond, um, just so much like love and light in these girls. And at the end of the day, the director of the orphanage was telling us some of these girls' stories and a good portion of them were survivors of human trafficking. And this was after months of God speaking to me about this issue. And I just lost it. And I remember going back to our hotel, which, you know, ironically was like this nice hotel in the middle of Guadalajara. And we had just been on the outskirts at this orphanage, very impoverished part of town. And I just felt like, disgusted honestly by like the like the, the disparity there and realizing that the only thing that separated me from these girls is that I was born into a family that protected me and gave me opportunities to flourish and to not be vulnerable to human trafficking and these girls were born into a family that I don't know all their stories but a lot of them their own families exploited them right and I just remember sitting there being like, God, like, why, why not me? Like, it's kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around and a very like philosophical conversation. But I just remember like laying it all at his feet and being like, I, nothing else matters. Like the things that I'm stressed out about in LA of like, whether I booked that audition or not, it just all became so clear to me that none of that mattered. Um, and I just said, God, like, use me however you will. And I just went back to LA after that and we were about to film that first short film that I'd been developing. And I knew that after we got through that, I wanted to tell some story related to human trafficking. So I just started diving in, doing all the research I could um, before trying to tell a story about this from like my privileged perspective, you know? So I just started reaching out and interviewing people, just doing my research. And around the same time, um, a girl that I knew from acting class when I was 13 from Philly, who now lived in LA too, reached out to me and said, hey, we should produce something together. Like, I see you've been producing. So we met up and I told her about this call I felt to do something about human trafficking. And it turns out that her mom, like the next day she talked to her mom and her mom, she didn't even know it was like on this board or involved somehow at this women's safe home for survivors in Philadelphia. So um, she introduced us to some women there, um, amazing women that co-wrote this book and um, just became just amazing resources for us and co-produced this with us. And so that's the short documentary that cool. um, I invited you guys to. Yeah. And that kind of just opened up a lot of other things, like through interviewing people for that kind of pre-development um, process, I... Um, COVID hit when we were developing that. So then we were all like our production got delayed and I had been in our, I had been hired to host a podcast for a company. So I realized like, oh, I actually really like po hosting podcasts. So I just started mm -hmm. interviewing people um, that were subjects for my documentary and saying like, will you be willing to do this um, as a podcast? And that's when I started my podcast. So from there, everything's kind of grown, but it really has just kind of comes back to answering your question. It just came back to like saying yes, you know, and like just taking the next step. I think sometimes um, it can feel overwhelming when you feel called to something like this and like, how am I going to get there? And just to take the next step and then to really look back and see like when you say it all is this one story, it seems like this big culmination. But um, in the moment, it can be these insignificant things that you don't notice at the time. Totally. And I think that was one thing that at the Exodus Cry Retreat, which I was so lucky to go to, you guys encouraged us to really write out our story and write out those small moments because sometimes it can seem insignificant, but when you look back on it and you see just all those small nuanced ways that God was guiding you um, and none of them were uh, coincidental and it was all very intentional. So Absolutely. Yeah. We've had a, a lot of um, survivors of trafficking and um, sex industry related 
survivors on our podcast and um and it's always you know so moving to hear their stories and uh and oftentimes those conversations steer in a direction that's not <clears throat> so much necessarily about their trauma as it mm -hmm. is the message they're carrying and things right. they're passionate about in this season and that's really amazing as well um but I also enjoy talking to people who have been drawn into this movement, just not because they're a survivor, but just out of their own kind of human compassion. And I think I've like really resonated with your story because I've been very passionate about film for a pretty young age, actually, and um, and definitely felt drawn to film as a career. But I couldn't reconcile with like, how is this going to help the world? Yeah. You know, and I think differently now, but I was always like, I feel called to like help the world, change the world in some way, like to have some deeper meaning other than like, I guess at the time for me, it just felt a little bit vain. And I was like, so similar to you, it was really like the issue of trafficking that like something locked into place as far as um, marrying these two passions of like, I love film, I love like creative expression, I just, I love telling stories, I love the aesthetic, the three-dimensional canvas, like there's so much that I love about it, but it was really like when I married it with a passion to change the world, this issue of human trafficking, that things started to click for me. And so I love that part of your story. And um, shout out <laughs> for anyone who's listening to this that lives in, in Southern California. We've been doing these faith, film, and justice mixers. So it's like gathering people who have a passion yep. for film, for their faith and for justice to get together. And to my amazement, it's been like so surprising and awesome to see how many people have come out of the woodwork. Yeah. Like that's like that's me. Totally. And it's so cool that we're starting to find each other. Like those of us who are working in the film space but really have a passion to help change the world and you know, specifically pertaining to this issue of trafficking. So, um, so what you shared about Guadalajara is also something that I feel like I can relate to because when I went to Thailand um, for the first time, I remember having conversations with people there about how Thailand is this, the land of contradictions and um, a world of contradictions, and they call it the land of smiles. Um, and so everyone has a smile on their face in Thailand. And on the surface, when you go there, you can get this impression that, oh, everybody's happy here. Um, but underneath it is this whole like other dark world of trafficking where so many of these young girls and young women are being used to fuel the appetites of predominantly Western men who are coming there on these like sex tours. And it's a really sad situation. 2.3 million people being trafficked, um, 800,000 children in the sex industry in Thailand. So it's, it's a horrible situation. And it's like when you go to a place like Guadalajara and you see that disparity, or you go to a place like Thailand and you see that disparity, it has this like existential impact on you of what am I, what do I do? Yeah. Like, wh like what am I doing with my life, with my time, my money, my energy? How can I go on with business as usual? Yeah. Like when I know that this is going on. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have my own journey in that, but I'm curious for you, like, what did it look like? coming back from that trip, how did you reconcile with seeing that, seeing the trafficking, seeing the disparity, um, just spiritually, emotionally? Yeah. And then also like, yeah, just how has that 
become integrated into your career sphere as a filmmaker? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I remember coming back and just like really praying to not forget it and to not let go of it because I think it's easy to have those moments um, where you're so impacted by something and you're like making this vow of like, I'm, I'm, I want to do something, I want to do something. But then we go back to our busy lives. We go back to the thing that stressed us out the week before. And it's like human nature to kind of slide back into what we know. And so I really, I'm a big journaler. And so I journaled for hours that day. And I um, just, and I still have that journal entry. And like when things are kind of tough, <laughs> I'll sometimes go back to it to like remember the why. And so that has been a big part of my process too, or in my journey too, and processing this all spiritually and emotionally as years have gone on is just journaling and staying in that place of prayer too. And, and also like, place of openness because I think sometimes at least for me like I like to have a solution right away and like an actionable thing right away which is not a bad thing always but it's also like if there was a solution to human trafficking like it would have already happened you know it's it's yeah. this I mean you know this better than me it's just like it's lifelong work and people yeah. building on the work of the people that came before them and so realizing my place kind of in that baton race so to speak mm, and that's um, interesting yeah that's a good perspective yeah like i'm not the entire answer to this i'm carrying a baton in exactly. this season exactly yeah. sorry keep and going no, i just well, I love yeah, that absolutely and just to like stay then open because i think for me like i get really locked into like okay this is what i'm doing we're going for it i will stop at nothing and honestly like that has gotten in my own way as a person of faith throughout my career like it comes from a good place but um, just being open to like the subtle nudges of the Lord because like on it, he's the one that we are co-laboring with and not to do it in my own strength because um, I have many times, especially at that point in my life, this was during, this was in 2018. Um, and so I've come a long way since then, but I really put this like undue pressure on myself and it's a constant journey to get away from that. But I think, and this is one thing I really feel like I've learned from you is just realizing like as much as God cares about like his children that are enslaved and trafficking, he cares about us who are fighting for it. And to never, um, even when you feel like, oh, this is this frivolous thing and I'm so privileged and I shouldn't, like my problems aren't real because they're not as big as someone that's enslaved and trafficking that can be a really slippery slope to go down because then you're um, neglecting your own humanity and and your own pain that needs to be healed. And if that's not healed, it is a very quick uh, journey to burnout. And um, so true. Yeah, and just like letting go of expectations of how it looks. So like, as from the filmmaker side, it's like, okay, we're doing this short film. Like it has to get into Sundance. It has right, to get like right, all right. these markers of success that we, that the world puts on it. And honestly, that short film, like we had, it was a really arduous journey getting it done. Like we were trying to film it during COVID before COVID we knew was happening. We had plans to film it during spring of 2020. And then the whole production process, just things that shouldn't have happened. I mean, post-production, things that shouldn't have happened, like audio files going missing and just weird things happening. And um, it's like, why am I even doing this? You have that moment of like wanting to give up. And then when it was done, um, just having those expectations of like what success looks like. But I can just say one of the things that happened was it, the reason why I'm sitting here on this podcast and now working on a project with you guys is because of that film. So you like, you never know yeah. the ways in which God is working and moving. And um, even just hearing stories of people that met at that screening, like survivors we had there um, who got involved with other people that had like ministries. And it's just cool to see so cool. um, you never know the ways in which God is working and sometimes like he's kind enough to show you a little glimpse of it. But even if I never would have had those 
um, tangible things, just understanding that there's a lot going on that we don't always necessarily know and to just, yeah, keep taking the next step. And That's so good. But I'm going to ask you, we made this That's joke ahead so of time. Cool. We have a podcast. So I'm going to try to ask Benji all the questions. <laughs> I have How a follow-up you... question. Okay. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> No, that's so good. I I also, one of the things that we also really connected on is um, you have a podcast called The Imperfect Podcast. And so you and I are both people who have like struggle with perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And there's a fine line between striving for excellence and being a perfectionist. And um, being a perfectionist as a filmmaker is hard enough because yeah. like it's a very difficult craft to perfect. Like, um, and you're always growing as a filmmaker and a storyteller. You're always learning. There's technology is always evolving. Um, but with the trafficking issue, it, you feel so powerless because you're struck by something that is such a deeply egregious injustice that your natural impulse is i need to end this like today yeah and like when you, when you're at an orphanage in guadalajara for me you know watching girls be trafficked in costa rica or at an orphanage in moldova you know you know these kids are going to age out to traffickers and just so many situations in my head where I'm like, like I want to take all of you and like bring you to a place of safety. And, but I can't like, and, and obviously we can help and there is work we can do, but I don't have the metaphysical capacity to like gather all of these children in the world that are at risk or being exploited or whatever. And, um, and so like, that's been difficult at times as a perfectionist where I'm like, you just kind of are like, well, I, I either want to fix this or just quit. Right. You know, like, yeah, there's and, no in between. <laughs> and so it really forces you, it like brings up like this issue of you, like you really have to work on your perfectionism to be able to navigate this really fallen imperfect world that we live in. And I'm curious for you, like what the emotional journey of fighting trafficking has been like as a perfectionist. Yeah. Um, it's been a journey, all right. <laughs> um, but I think even getting back to that point of like, God cares just as much about his children yeah. that are fighting this as his children that are enslaved. And it's like, I was enslaved to my own perfectionism and my identity was rooted in that. And it's something that keeps, like I constantly have to work on, you know, like I've come a really far away, but it's still just always there. And um, is it okay if I share this passage yeah, yeah. that um, the other day just came up for me because it's like, that thorn in my side. I feel like the perfectionism and there's um, 2 Corinthians 12 where in, in the message he talks about it um, as like the handicap and that are because of those, um, because of the extravagance of those revelations. And so I wouldn't get a big head. I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Um, and then it goes on. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift, and I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and then he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in my weakness. Um, and that's just mm -hmm. truncated version of it. But so good. Um, it's just like that is what my struggle with perfectionism and it stems from OCD. Like I was diagnosed with OCD when I was a kid. So it's, but I think even then sometimes that's an easy way to like put a label on our identity and say, feel like you're powerless to it. And that's actually not my identity. And so to constantly like come back to the Lord and say like, I'm not perfect in this. I'm never going to be perfect. And because I'm striving to be perfect, it actually gets in my own way. And I, causes all this anxiety and stress and things that just are not meant for me. And 
because of that though, like brings me to that place of surrender where then I actually can listen to like what God is doing and what he's saying about it. And That's so, cool. um, so that has been a big part of my journey is just learning how to surrender it. Um, and to really think of like, I think in terms of the magnitude um, of it, like we're in a really interesting time in society and humanity as a whole where we have so much access to all the pain and suffering going on around the world in a way that I don't think we ever really were intended to know. Like we just, our psyche is not meant to carry that. And so just realizing like we're not all called to, to solve every single pain and suffering and injustice in this world. Um, and to ask God, like, what is that? What can I focus on today? You know? And, um, so yeah, it's just been that constant, like taking one day at a time, as cliche as that sounds, and um, not putting my identity in like what I do or don't do. Um, That's so, so yeah. good. Yeah, the identity piece is huge. Yeah, and yeah, being able to find your identity as chosen, beloved, um, instead of some exterior thing that you do or some performance or and that's so key how has that looked for you as a perfectionist like fighting this and all like filmmaking all of that yeah i mean i've done it perfectly so i mean obviously that's (laughs) that's why we're here (laughs) i mean i don't like to brag but (laughs) i'm totally joking um yeah i think uh so something I've been thinking about a lot lately, I've just been doing a lot of like inner child work and, mm. and just going back to that person that I was as a child is I had a very um, bright, joyful, innocent, naive, kind of idealistic view of the world. And I just remember being so happy as a kid and, um, and, and, I have a son now who's like that. He just is always laughing and it it (laughs) brings me back to that. And so going into like the trafficking space and observing this was so like, it just felt like, how can this even be? It was like so difficult. And I think that that part of me like really broke. Yeah of like, how can I be a happy, joyful, like somewhat naive person that's like just obsessed with the beauty of life while this is going on. And so I think for a long time, I didn't give myself permission to like be who I was as that innocent child anymore. Yeah. So I think for a while, like life got really heavy and really, in a way, like really dark, just trying to internalize and process the reality of this injustice. And in that season, I started to have thoughts that I never thought a person like me would ever have of like, just not wanting to be on this planet anymore. And I remember in that season going to this prayer room and this lady comes up to me and she's like, she just starts saying, she said some stuff, which is too personal to share, but she just basically read my mail and she said, you are like Jimmy Stewart's character and it's a wonderful life. And she said, but you need to know that you're a gift. And um, like, you've been thinking about some things, but you need to know that you're a gift. And I looked at her, I've told this story a couple of times. I looked at her and I was like, lady, you are a prophetess. And she goes, I know. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. And um, it was so powerful for me to see myself in that light and um 
That's awesome. Somebody said something to me recently in this like little surf club. And this one day I went down to the beach and nobody was down there. It was late on a Monday night or like Monday afternoon, I guess, like it was dusk. So I'm, so I was like just body surfing and running up and down the beach with my towel in the wind. And like, I was just having the best time like down there by myself. Yeah. And it was such a fun, liberating That's moment. Awesome. And I texted my little surf club. I was like, man, I was just like having all this fun down at Salt Creek, like running around the beach. Like life is so beautiful. I made that comment. And then one of the people in the group commented back, Benji, you are so beautiful. Wow. And it really like touched me deep to come back to that place of realizing that despite all the evil and injustice in this world and everything that we're surrounded with, that we, like I am a beautiful person who is a gift to this world. Yeah. That you are a beautiful person who is a gift to this world and like that that concept and I that idea for some reason was so powerful for me and I think what it's done just coming back to the conversation about perfectionism is it's helped me realize that we do live in a world of contradictions and despite the injustice and the evil and darkness and all the ugly things that are happening on our planet, there is beauty. There is love. Like there is light. There is goodness. And so it helped me reconcile with that tension and then to realize that my job, like being perfect, like my job is not that I'm going to wave a wand over this whole situation and then it's going to go away no matter how bad I want for that to happen. My job is to contribute mm. the gift that I have to give yeah. in, in this space. So it's it's both like humbling in a way, like accepting my own limitations, my own limited capacity to change the world is like so humbling and vulnerable, but it's also become somewhat freeing and liberating and satisfying to realize that like I have what I have to give and that's enough. Exactly. Yeah. Like that's hard because I'm like, apparently it's not, or like these people wouldn't still be getting trafficked, right? But that's the part that we all have to play. It's like, we're not going to end this alone. Yeah. I have a gift to give and you have a gift to give that's different. And somebody else has a gift to give that's different. If we all are, you know, able to offer the gift that we have to give to solve problems like human trafficking, hunger, contaminated water, you know, fill in the blank, homelessness, like we will change the world. So I think I've become more, after 17 years in this movement, I've become more protective of my own candle, so to speak. You have to be. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all that. And I also feel like even the journey that we go on in that is a gift and can be a gift to others. So It's interesting hearing you talk about that darker time in your life because that was before I met you. And I feel like ever since I've met you, you do exude that like playful. It's funny because like I have you on my podcast and you're just like, you go in and it's like, dang, like it's so compelling. And when you're speaking that like righteous justice and comes out. um, But then like just knowing you on like a personal level and as like a friend, like you have that carefree, like joyful, like it, the work that you've done to get in touch with your inner child really shows and has been inspiring, honestly, to me on my journey as someone that's like entered into this space more recently. And um, I know that that just has an impact on so many other people. So even that imperfect journey of feeling like we're inadequate 
and then having to go on that journey of like reconciling that with ourselves. That journey you went on was a gift to me and I know is a gift to other people. So it's just cool to even see like, and then obviously your perfect filmmaking is um, <laughs> is a gift, is a gift. Awesome. and just everything you guys have done with Exodus Cry. But um, it's just once you start to recognize, like you said, that it all matters, even being able to like tap into the beauty of life and even getting back to the filmmaking stuff. I think you mentioned this earlier of like, if it's not something that's like helping people, it feels frivolous as a filmmaker. And I agree with that, but I also feel like, and I know you've, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but even just tapping into films and creating films that bring out the beauty and the light of joy, of, and joy of life um, is important too. And just like not letting ourselves stay in that box of like how we can impact other people. Because again, it might not always look the way you think it will, but um, just being authentically like connected to your own humanity can have such an impact on the people around you. Hi guys, this is Benji Nolo from Exodus Cry, and I'm just so excited to announce the release of my new book called uh, Raised on Porn. This is something that I've been working on for the past 10 years and just uh, excited to get it into your hands to help deepen your understanding of porn its impact on our world, uh, on our lives, and what we can do to heal from it. And so I think you're gonna find this to be an extremely insightful and helpful resource, whether you are somebody who is struggling with porn consumption, whether you're a parent and, uh, and wanting to help uh, have better conversations with your kids and protect your kids, uh, whether you're an educator, whether you're uh, in a relationship and and, and this has in some way affected your relationship, I think this, is, this book's gonna be a super helpful resource. I wrote it in such a way um, to uh, be that resource that I wish was there when I started into this. So it's comp both comprehensive and in-depth. And if you're looking for a one-stop shop, so to speak, I think this is that book that you can get a hold of that's really going to give you the big picture and an in-depth way of how porn is affecting our world and us as individuals and our relationships and our children. And again, what we can do to, to heal, to find freedom, to uh, and to, to really to to better our society. And so um, I encourage you, get a hold of this book, Raised on Porn, and share it with a friend as well. Thanks so much. I think that when when we're in this space, you know, and you're 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 trying to take an inventory for, okay, there's 42 million people that are being trafficked, and there's this situation, and there's the porn industry, and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and you're you're doing the math and you're taking an inventory it can feel like really overwhelming to your spirit but at the same time what it part of, on a positive side of what it's done is it's made me more grateful for like very simple things like um to your point about like the films our approach is always like i heard a quote one time that there are two things that pierce the human heart tragedy and beauty and so we always try to combine those yeah. things in our films and towards the end of this one recent film that we just premiered, uh, I asked this trafficking survivor, what are you grateful for? And um, she said, she thought about it for a second and then she started to get tears in her eyes and she said, <laughs> she said, I'm grateful that we mow the lawn on Saturdays. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that like makes me emotional because I'm like, there's so much beauty in our world that we overlook because of just like we're maybe we're just not in touch with how bad it can be, you know? And and when you are, when you see the world through this lens of like, hey, trafficking's happening, it's happening all around us, it's happening every day, makes you feel so much more grateful for like simple things. And then I'll just share this last story and we need to turn this back into me asking you a question. I told you I was going to hijack. I was already on your podcast. <laughs> I went to this, this, 
some people may maybe will think this story is like i don't know like to me it was a big deal like i i went with a friend to this coldplay concert and um we were just so uplifted through the experience of it a hundred thousand people just basically celebrating life together and and just this spirit of unity and love like um I'm suspending the criticism that I can hear in my own head from different people right now. Just to make a small point, we were felt very uplifted in this environment. And so afterwards we were processing and talking about it. And we both like landed on the same conclusion, which was what it unlocked in us both was like, all I want is to love people. And now, and the other person's like, "That's all I want, you know. Yeah. Like, that's all we want." Like, yeah. and there's, it feels like there's so many obstacles to that. There's, you know, politics and church cult. And there's just like so many obstacles to like just being able to live from the heart. Like, and it was so refreshing to be in an environment where you were given full permission just to send that love into the universe without any criticism, anybody telling you, well, that's a wrong belief system or whatever. Like, it's just like, I exist. Like my greatest passion is to love people and I am not apologetic for that. And I'm sending that love like into the universe. That's and amazing. Like, yeah. And I think that's like something you know, that we need, like, in this movement is, like, we're not motivated by any other thing than to, <laughs> I, I know it sounds cheesy, but, like, to spread the love, yeah. like, to people who desperately need it. Like, totally. Well, even, like, yeah, like you said, all, of, it, it's such a struggle to even be able to, like, do that. Like you said, the the world we live in. And I honestly think that world, like, the politics and the, all of the cancel culture, like everything is what is like a barrier for entry for people to even get involved in this movement, honestly. Like people are scared. And I myself, like when I first got involved in this, I was like felt myself scared to even like share anything about my social media because I'm like, am I going to say the wrong thing? Da, da, da. And there's like some wisdom in that, like doing your research and um, making sure that you're not just like, tweeting out whatever you feel without any kind of like understanding. But I just think that in the world we live in, it's gotten so divisive and polarizing that you don't even know sometimes like, and people feel that, totally. right? So totally. I, I just think that the more that we can connect to the people that we're serving, the people that we're doing this with, the people that we love, like, 40.3 million people is a very like overwhelming number. Um, but thinking of the one person, you know, like one thing someone always told me was um, in terms of storytelling, like people get really overwhelmed. Our, our human brains can't even really fathom like that amount of suffering. And when you think of the Holocaust as an example, like the number, I don't even know the number, but like the number is obviously staggering and overwhelming. But people can connect with one person's story. Yes. They can connect with Anne Frank, right? Like that's why I believe her story, one of the reasons why it's so powerful and so popular is because we can connect with that one person. But all the numbers, it just becomes dehumanizing. And so I think that's where our role as storytellers and filmmakers is to be able to sh to, to hang that light on um, the individual stories. And then hopefully that can inspire people to – get involved because then they stop getting in their head about, oh, is what's the politics of this? And right, is this like right. there's no politics to caring for people. There shouldn't be. And so the more that we can focus on like why am I actually doing this and what are these people's stories? Like I remember I watched that your guys' most recent film, um, the mowing the lawn part was where I lost it because it's just it's you take it for granted. And so the more we can focus on people's stories, the more that I think it's a lot more sustainable. Well, I love that scene in Schindler's List when he 
when the one character points out, the Jewish Talmud states that he who saves one life saves the world entire. And he was trying to encourage Oscar Schindler, like how important his mission was, you know, and sometimes you, you, you have to approach this work through that lens of, like I said, either if I'm thinking about myself, like, okay, I'm not the Messiah. Yeah. Like I can't save the world. There is no such thing as a superhero, like, but I can offer like the gift that I have to give. And on the other side of it, like there's the 40 plus million. Um, how can I impact the life of one person? Like, and thinking about that one person and creating space for that one person and holding that one person in your heart of like just being able to find so much like joy and purpose and deep fulfillment and like my love can help change your life yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. And like, so yeah, so I think, you know, just kind of to bring this back to the point about filmmaking is how can we create films that don't deny the darkness and don't, you know, um, water down the darkness. We want to be authentic about the injustice that exists in our world, but how can we also um, infuse our films with a sense of hope, with a sense of beauty, with love, with like those things that are the transformative elements of our world. And so, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's really interesting, I think, for us to just be taking on this issue as humans and then like translating that into our filmmaking experience. And part of the reason, I mean, I would say the main reason why we wanted to have you on the podcast, other than, you know, <laughs> you're one of my good friends now and like your boyfriend's my best friend uh. and like, <laughs> and like, all, I'm, all the I'm just as always the third wheel now. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, is like, yeah, I think you're such a model of what I'm hoping like will happen among other people like that people who have become interested in this space will look at their profession as a way and a means to make a difference instead of like, well, I just need to quit everything exactly and go become an anti-trafficking person. Right. Like, no, like God's planted you somewhere for a reason, whether that's as a filmmaker or whether that's in business or whether that's in, you know, athletics or wherever it is. And like in whatever space or capacity we're working in, we all have the opportunity to take our career calling and translate it into something that we can help make a difference in the world. Absolutely. And and that's what I always say. And I'm just like, I kind of geek out over the fact that like in the same vein that it can be really overwhelming when you look at all the layers to this issue and what needs to be um needs to happen in order for trafficking to become eradicated, whether it be like the legislative side or th of things, like those same things that seem daunting also in a way excites me because it is, like you said, everyone has a gift to give. Like, I don't, I'm not a legislator. <laughs> like, I don't know enough about that, but I know that like it has a huge part to play. Like, um, there was a bill recently making child trafficking a major felony in California. And um, at first it was like it didn't go through. And then because I, I believe so many people have become more engaged on this issue on social media, like it went and you excess cry made a reel about it and people started to get activated. And then all of a sudden it went for an emergency hearing and Gavin Newsom like a return. I don't know. And now it just got passed into this is this is why I'm not a legislator because I don't know all the details. But I know that there was actual impact that happened that moved the needle. A groundswell of social activism that yes. moved the needle legislatively. Right. And that that exactly. is like so powerful. Yep. But it was but it took the actual legislators and the Congress people or the senators that were 
even proposing this bill to be using their sphere of influence to push this issue forward. I know a lawyer that like uses his services pro bono to um, help survivors who were um, charged with crimes during their you know, when they were in the life. Like they, um, he helps them get that off their record. Like things like that, where it's just like everyone has a, a part to play, and even if it's not something as big as that. Like I said, just taking the next step. Like it felt so insignificant to me when I was just like interviewing people on my IGTV and like 10 people <laughs> turning viewing in, right? But it's like you just never know the ways in which um, your simple yes will impact things and more than impact things, like impact you, you yeah. know, like this journey more than anything I would say has transformed my life and given more meaning and like you said, like just the ability to to see the love in things and um, how how even just the simplest things are something to be grateful for and um, see as Absolutely. beautiful. So yeah, I think it sounds cliche, but just taking one step at a time and really looking at like what is in my hands. And I love what you said of like, I don't have to quit my job tomorrow. Like I still work full time at a film studio, but like it's – this kind of activism has taken on a life of its own. And um, anytime I start to get overwhelmed of like, how do I balance the two things? Like it actually always, the two always end up serving each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you really are like opening your hands up and like letting God direct your steps, like he'll lead you to that place. And, um, and like I said, shared before, like having that handicap and having that awareness of our limitations actually enables us to just open ourselves up to like what he wants to do in our lives so absolutely and i love what i love about your journey is the authenticity because i think that we are exposed to so much as you mentioned earlier because of social media and just you know the internet media in general today like we're exposed to so much and so um, in a way it can feel overwhelming. Like you can get compassion fatigue. Yeah. And part of the temptation is just to shut it all out. And like, I know for me, like I'm such an all or nothing person. And so I'm like, I either want to hear all of it or none of it, you know? And like, um, so it becomes harder it becomes more difficult to create space mm -hmm. in your life to like really deeply authentically internalize the reality of an injustice like trafficking but ultimately i think that's really important and again the cause could be something else it could be you know that there are you know people in the world who don't have access to clean water right and and deeply internalizing what would that be like and then you know but whatever the the cause of the issue is it, it's important for us to deeply internalize that thing that has touched our heart or pierced our heart or that we've been uniquely exposed or awakened to um for the very purpose like in your situation and mine as well is that's the only way to then create visibility and expression of these injustices yeah. in an authentic way through the arts right so we want filmmakers who are not just you know doing something because it's commercially marketable or um, we want filmmakers whose lives have been deeply affected by, you know, things like this so that their own way of giving expression to that injustice um, can be felt by the audience. Absolutely. And I love what uh, Robert Frost said. He said, no tears in the author, no tears in the reader. Wow. So this idea that we don't impart what we say, we impart who we are. And so I think that that has to come through. Yeah. In like 
these creative projects that we work on. And so I know, like in your case, how you hold this issue with such reverence. And it really excites me for like your film projects and the project that we're working on together, because I know it comes from a place of deep authenticity and, and a deep, it's not like, yeah, it's like you hold this with reverence. I think that's really important. Yeah, thank you. And I, I love that Robert Frost quote. Um, and to like allow ourselves like the full spectrum of those emotions and to really like let ourselves process it. And like the perfectionists in us that want to go do something right away, like to let that marinate and like – it will come out in the way it's supposed to because um, if you just get so focused on I have – in this film project needs to look this specific way and you're so focused on the outcome versus letting yourself have that emotional journey and process that and then letting that spill out. Um, like you said, it's if, if it doesn't move you, it's not going to move the audience. So, um, and not limiting yourself on how it looks either. Like whether it be narrative or documentary or even something that's not necessarily about trafficking, but like speaks to um, the human experience and the places where people are um, taken advantage of and things like that. Like that can also be a, a gateway to open people up to the exploitation of people. So that's kind of been the journey that I've been on is just giving myself that freedom as an artist to like explore like what that expression of how this has impacted me looks like. That's so awesome. Um, what would you say? I'm curious, like you're such a great, you have like, I feel like your podcast, the tone feels like um, almost like it has like a mentoring kind of tone to it. Um, you bring on a lot of people to talk about like, yeah, just different issues really of like personal growth. And um, and I'm curious like how you would counsel, counsel others who are maybe young aspiring filmmakers, um, how to balance and approach this work of filmmaking while also staying connected to the real world. Um, the film industry can be such an escape, you know, in a way. Yeah. And there are many good people in the film industry, but it can be an escape from reality where, right? Like, I mean, and in a way, like for some people, that's why they watch movies. Like, right. it's an escape. Yeah. And, um, and so, the Hollywood bubble or whatever, you know, like um, how would you encourage young aspiring filmmakers to not come into this industry and just escape the real world, Yeah. but to stay grounded to the injustices that maybe are somehow oftentimes veiled to us? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, well, one thing that I've been noticing just as an aside in the film industry and people that I work with that have had like huge commercial successes, like people that I know um, in Hollywood and there's even a fatigue from them of not wanting to make things that are frivolous. Like I think especially after like just it seems like each year there's just like more and more that's just like building and I think people see like what are we doing? Like the, the, we have to use our film for things that actually make an impact and help the world at large and move the needle. And so obviously not everyone is that way, but I've just noticed there is kind of this shift in people wanting to do things with that matter. I think especially like Hollywood has become obsessed with IP and things based on IP for like the, oh, the last several years. And so really just like I myself am craving seeing more like personal stories and I think people are feeling that too. And I think just advice to like young filmmakers, there's always this like chase for what are the mandates that studios are looking for to green light right now. And I think it can be a really dangerous like rabbit hole to get down. It's a game of whack-a-mole because it can constantly changes and the pendulum swings. And I have um, a writing mentor that always says like write the thing that breaks your heart 
and write the thing that excites you as a filmmaker because the pendulum will eventually swing back. And we know this, but films take a really long time to get made. Scripts take a really long time to complete. And so you can have these different torches on the fire and not worrying about the commercial success of it and how it's going to sell or not. Because while that is important, um, I think if that's your main focus, then you are disconnecting from your humanity. And there's a reason why studio executives don't write scripts. Like, so um, being, they're looking to the filmmaker and the, the screenwriter to bring their humanity to it. So no matter what voices are swirling of like what will be commercially viable or whatnot, to just really focus on what is that thing that breaks your heart and what is the story that's burning on your heart because we all have that and just to follow that and not put any limitations on it and it might take a different like life of its own but um yeah just just remaining authentic to that story that's inside of you that's so good i i sometimes think of this idea that was communicated to me once follow your tears for it is marking out your path. Wow. And so I've talked about that at times when I teach on documentary filmmaking, when people are considering like, you know, wanting to make a documentary, how do I qualify a story? Like what story do I tell? And I think that's such a great place to start is what is that thing that has really like captured your heart, that thing that you have shed tears over because that is marking out your path. Right. And in the documentary space, it's it's really important. I mean, narrative fem- f- feature filmmaking is is has its own set of challenges and difficulties, but documentary is exceptionally difficult and challenging work. There's not a big financial, you know, benefit to it. It is really like people and this is part of the reason why I love documentary as a genre is it, it really draws people who are genuinely pure of heart from the sense of of wanting to contribute something valuable to the world in terms of helping us understand the world. And um, to go on that journey is like, it just requires so much investment and self-sacrifice and um it doesn't happen over months. It's, it happens over years. And um, and I think that the, the difficulty and the challenge and the obstacles of making documentaries necessitates that you have, like whatever issue you're addressing, that you have really gone into it because something has moved you deeply at a heart level. And... Um, so I really resonate with that. And I'm going to uh, give you the last word while we wrap this up. But I just want to say that I've, I've always enjoyed our conversations. And now with your boyfriend being a huge Kings fan, we've, we've been like, we need to do a separate podcast to talk about the Kings. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a diehard Los Angeles Kings hockey fan. Um, I always enjoy like talking with you and... Um, and just the commonality of these shared passions just makes it so, such edifying conversation. Is there anything else that's kind of burning on your heart before we wrap up that you'd like to talk about? So much. I'm like, I feel like every time when you were on my podcast, I was like, we need a part two. I know, Because we know. can literally talk for hours. But um, I don't know. I just, I think I want to bring it back to... Um, and I, I've shared this with you, but I don't think I shared it in this interview, but like just the work that like you guys are doing is so um, important, not only to like pushing the needle forward and like people understanding this issue, but to the people like me that have felt called to this. Like, um, so the first film I ever saw um, of Exos Cry was Liberated. And it was um, a month after I had just finished filming my documentary. And um, Kim Biddle, who was in that, um, I had met her and her and her husband were just like speaking life into me. And then she was like, you should watch this film. Um, And it seems like similar like what you're doing. And I just remember watching it and not only 
feeling so heartbroken, but feeling so seen because I was like, this thing that I feel like called to do to use film to and like my unadorned like passion for film combined with this injustice and not making like corny PSAs, but actually just using the power of filmmaking to move things forward. And um, both you and Helen have mentioned like William Wilberforce and just like how much that has made an impact on um, your guys' journey and how the artists during his time made such an impact in pushing the needle forward. And Helen sent me this whole dissertation on that. I have to, I can't even quote it correctly, but <laughs> just like um, dating back to like just for generations, like storytellers and um, creatives have always had such a part to play in like shifting the public's perception of things. And that's something that I really felt like in my gut and then seeing you guys doing it and like doing it on such a level that is so well done um, just inspired me to keep going. And so it, like I said, full circle to be now sitting here and had completely unrelated friend that was on a call with you that was like, you should meet Benji and connected <laughs> us years later. Um, and so I guess just like thanking you guys yeah. for that, like yeah. thanking you for really just providing such like mentorship and um, just community to, to not feel alone in this. And then just anyone that is out there that feels a calling towards either this issue issue or something else, like um, you're not alone in that. And just to like take the next step and um, you'll be amazed how, even if it takes years to unfold, like how that one simple yes could lead to just um, so many I mean, beautiful things. And it's so rewarding for us to, you know, make a film and then know that it inspired somebody like yourself as well. And so that, thank you for sharing that. That means a lot. And yeah, I, I hope that for those that listen to this, they'll feel emboldened to take that next, next step. And if anyone is in Southern California, yes. um, we invite you to our faith film and justice mixers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, hopefully we're going to have another one coming up here soon. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank and, you so yeah, much. This was great. Yeah. Thank you. You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at exoduscry.com and join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.